I said, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're logging in from. Uh, I was hoping that virtual gets me some freedom to look at some names or whatever, but of course that you want me, I have to be a bit more careful. Uh, but having said that, I'm so happy that I'm having an opportunity to talk to the panelists because they're good friends, and we have been also talking to each other a lot over the last few years. Uh, and there's some similarity in what we're thinking, uh, perhaps on the way ahead. So it's great to have them here, and I've always been very keen to hear their views. So there's another opportunity for me to hear from them. There are a couple of instances that you know have uh, kind of got me thinking, and one of them was. Uh, I think somewhere in 2014, when my son came up to me and I'd gifted him a T-shirt and he asked me, do you know where this was manufactured? And were they having child labor in the manufacturing house? And it gave me a sense of what's coming from the next generation and how we have a different perspective on, uh, on the things that we have been doing. And the second was, you know, we had a large ship that was transiting Malacca Straits and uh, suddenly we had a challenge with the navigation systems and all we could do was hope and pray uh, that we had good weather, clear visibility until we got into the port. Uh, and it also occurred, actually that was really the birth of Alpha Ori to be honest. Uh, so while there are these interesting things that are happening, there's also a lot of clutter and noise uh, on the other side. So people are getting a bit confused. Uh, like they said, don't have technology just for the sake of having a technology. So how do we look through the clutter and get into more details? Uh, so that's uh, that's one part of smart ship operations. And again, uh, we're talking about decarbonization. And I feel uh, in that one, I want to look at it more from a perspective on what's the right thing to do for the oncoming generations and how we can leave this planet a base. Uh, I'm sure there are regulations for us to comply, but I think that needs to evoke a lot more conscious from uh, deep within. So uh, I don't want to talk more, I'd rather hear from the amazing panelists we have. Uh, just as a synopsis for this panel, uh, what we thought could be interesting is that we will try and slice this in four pillars. The first, given that they all come from different backgrounds, tech backgrounds, how do they see the organizations evolving and adapting to this change that's coming along? Uh, that might be first pillar. The second, what really is the smart ship operation and decarbonization? And how can we use that information that's available to build better insights? How are customer expectations changing? Uh, and the third is, where do we compete and where do we collaborate? Because given their large perspective, I think that may be useful. And last but not the least, why Singapore? How is Singapore uniquely positioned to make this happen? I'm, I'm a big fan of Singapore. Uh, if not for Singapore, I think Synergy and Alphori would not have been there. So uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, they set you up for something. That's, I think, meaningful. So these are the four things. And I will, you know, I think the panelists need no introduction, but I feel that maybe pass it to them to introduce. And Chucky, thank you so much for logging in. It's, it's quite early in the morning for you from where you are. So thank you. You're not new to Singapore, uh, but I live to Kenneth. Uh, then Steen, who are physical, and then uh, Chucky to do a quick intro before we get into the interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kenneth. Uh, so I was uh, actually the CTO of MPA before uh, this year, right? And uh, then I took on the assistant CE position for MPA. And the reason my CEO asked me to the room was this. She said that, you know, Kenneth, in the next foreseeable future, the maritime industry needs digitalization, innovation capabilities. So the whole industry drive, this must be the driver for change. And hence, I'm putting you to be in charge of industry cluster, right? So which is why uh, from a CTO, I become an ace and know that there's a big shoe to fill and many things to learn, right? So now Thomas become the CTO of MPA. 
any technical question now, I can pretend that I don't know. I can say, ask Thomas. Uh, but what I have seen in the past uh, three years, four years, is that really the industry need pacing in terms of innovation. The first thing that we, when I was asked to do research and digitalization in marine time, was are there enough committed people who want to change? Because that starts, it all starts with people, right? Whether there are enough people who have this zest uh, to change. And I'm very glad that when I look around the industry, there are many leaders in this panel, Captain Uni, Chucky, Steen, and many in the industry who are ready to take this journey forward. Then, if you have these leaders, the next question will be, so are there innovators in the industry? Uh, and what are the platforms that you can create to bring the people together? Again, it's about the people, the ecosystem. So what we have done is we bring together the R&D's uh, institution uh, under Sanjay uh, SMI uh, so that they create center of excellence. Then we create Pier 71 under you know, uh, NUS Enterprise, Mark is here, and uh, create the startup ecosystem. Then we get the student internship under Singapore Maritime Foundation. So we start to bring innovators together so that if you have leaders and you have solvers, then innovation can happen. So I think in many areas, whether it's port, ship, or even land-based transformation, things are moving. Are we there yet? I think, uh, if you ask me, I, I've seen uh, many innovation happen. And I think even Wasila is here, Chris is here. I've seen uh, autonomous vessel. Uh, we have seen Wilhelmsen doing 3D printing. We have yesterday launched the drone estate. So you find that there are now many more technology and innovation that are available to marine time. And some are organic from uh, the industry, and some actually are from external. The health, the telemedicine comes from the medicine uh, uh, area. You have the insurance, and you can have a fintech uh, industry player that come together as well. So I think, and then what we have seen is uh, now we have seen investors coming in, the VCs coming in to invest into the startup, the innovators. So I think that is, uh, to me, a very healthy sign. Of course, uh, like, like uh, Captain Uni and Sanjeev, they started how uh, a ship might look like in future, how you monitor them, and how do you do to address sustainability. I think those are fantastic examples. So I, I won't take up too much time, but I think maybe I'll just leave with what's next. To me, it is, uh, you know, you have innovation, you have leaders, you have ecosystem. But what we now need is even more attractive business models. I think that is the one that we could change the industry. How do you uh, do electrification of hovercraft and then have a new business model for hovercraft? How do you manage ship in a new business model? How do you do compliance and standard in a new business model? I, I thought those are very exciting areas that we can now start to have because we have built up the foundation. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass on to Steen. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Kenneth, for this. Um, and and Steen, uh, maybe a bit of, you know, don't need any introduction, but maybe you can tell people who you are. And, and taking on that question from uh, you have a very different perspective, different background. Of course, you've been with Musk and, you know, you've been through the whole value chain. And now you, you are in a place where, as an industry, you in a lot of organizations. So where do you see the whole digital ecosystem coming along? What are some of the challenges? And are, are organizations really able to adapt enough and evolve? Or if not, what could be uh, some of the ways in which we could do this better? Thank you, Uni. Um, I think I have to start with history first. Uh, uh, to, to put in perspective what we do in, in Rideship. So we were born uh, 20 years ago, uh, and, and until last year, we managed to avoid Singapore. That, that in itself is uh, 
quite impressive, and I'm glad we've changed that. Uh, so uh, I, I joined as uh, staff 0004, uh, end of last year, um, with the intent to do pretty much exactly what uh, we have collaborated on different platforms with, with MPA and with many other good stakeholders in, in Singapore uh, around. Essentially, how do we use the, the ecosystem that is uh, available to all of us here? Um, come this summer, we will probably be about 20 of us uh, here in Singapore. So the growth is, is rapid and it's, it's just a good example of uh, why one would come to Singapore. Um, and in our case, it's really a question of doing uh, partly what Kenneth was talking about, innovating. Um, so we have set up a, a product and innovation hub uh, here, where uh, the primary intent with that is to co-create uh, together with technology partners uh, in listening to the market, listening to our current and what could become our future customers, what they would like us to become and to deliver to them. So in that sense, we are really a 20-year-old uh, startup. Uh, and, and lucky for us, uh, I, I appreciate that many startups struggle uh, because uh, um, funds uh, quickly run out and uh, ambitions are high. We have our 20 years of, uh, of, of existence to uh, support us. Uh, we are a profitable business in its own right and, and we have a positive cash flow. Um, so that's very comfortable, but it's also in many ways who we were. Um, who we were represents uh, a safety score, uh, which is used across approximately 50,000 vessels. Uh, who we were is a GHG rating uh, that was invented uh, and has become the standard really in the industry uh, since 2012 but it's a GHG rating that bases itself on EEDI and, and EVDI, so essentially design data. Great journey has, has been relevant for the industry because it has helped the industry to continuously seek out the best design and, and improve new builds as they come off the shipyards. Where we would like to make a difference uh, in, in this collaboration in the ecosystem in Singapore is really around um, carbon accounting models how can we shift the focus of uh, in the past having been design driven to in future uh, use some of the good technologies that are becoming available to us to create models uh, that give a carbon output instead of a modeled output based on the operation of the assets, based on a, a right here, right now inside. Uh, and, um, where we would like to go with this is to create a relevance both for ship owners um, to in the beauty contest that exists when you bring your, your asset forward uh, to a charterer to speak the truth and have the opportunity to compare in a fair manner through an independent agent uh, the data so that uh, you can benchmark that against all the other vessels in the fleet. And on the charterer's side, we are creating solutions that allow them at the point of vetting an insight into the carbon accounting output, if you like, of a potential vessel held against another one. Um, so we shift the focus from being design-oriented to be uh, a story of the truth. So uh, that's one example, and I'll, I'll stop here, but that's one very specific example of how we, in our organization, uh, make use of, of data uh, and transform it into useful uh, decision-making tools for many different aspects of the industry. No, thanks a lot, Steen. You know, for someone who, uh, you know, who uses a lot of your platform, I think this is refreshing to hear and very much forward looking uh, in, in this perspective. So thank you. And now uh, if I can go to Chakib. Chakib, obviously you don't have the challenge of funding because you're perhaps one of the largest energy giant in the world. So, uh, you know, but uh, to put things in context, of course, when you're large, there's also larger challenges. So how do you see that you're using data, you integrate between, you know, the whole supply chain uh, and, and how do you see Bari uh, in all this? And what are some of the things that you've been doing uh, that 
you know, can be interesting and we all can learn from. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to share this uh, opportunity with such a prestigious panel. Uh, good morning. So, uh, or afternoon or evening, sorry for me, it's very early in the morning. Uh, <clears throat> well, Bahari is uh, it's a very interesting uh, organization. Yes, as you mentioned, with the, the funding challenge. That said, I have also led startups from ground zero to productization, to monetization in the past. So it is, uh, it is not unknown to me. So I understand both sides of the table. Now, to be frank, it does not matter if you are on a startup or if you are an energy giant or a large organization. I believe technology adoption to be meaningful. It starts with having the right drivers and motivations of why you do it. So I like what was said earlier about not having technology adoption for the sake of technology adoption. You know, the tough competition that we have out there affects us as well and is pushing the entire industry to seek efficiencies and automation in order to remain competitive, in order to remain profitable. So this is very good news for technology because and technologies because it simply means that organizations will require to continue to create efficiencies by using technology to survive, not just because they want to or because they want something nice. However, the maturity level of many organizations or most organizations is very different. So what is clear to me is that every company has some level of digital transformation effort at some particular point, some more efficient than others, granted, but the need is clear. Now, there are challenges in the industry, and I think there are challenges, I could focus on many, but I, if we talk about commonalities, among pretty much every technology, right? Number one is we have today a lot of players in technology. And I think Singapore has played a major role in that. Uh, you have Alpha Ori, for example, there for a particular reason. Uh, so lack of players is not something we have in the maritime industry as we did five years ago. So when I hear people talk about lack of technology in maritime, that's not necessarily true anymore. What is true, however, is that there is a lack of a data orchestration platform to connect all the different verticals that we have today. When you talk about shipping, when you talk about logistics, you're talking about a major value chain that goes from A to Z. And each one of those aspects have many different solutions offered today by many old players and by many young organizations. But unfortunately, we do not see a data orchestration platform, or some people refer to it as a digital highway, to ensure that all these technologies are properly communicating with each other. We can take true advantage of data to create that uh, predictive environment, that advanced analytics that allow us to truly take advantage of it. Now, you asked, what are we doing in, in, in Bahari? Well, we, we have several initiatives. Uh, probably no, Bahari is a very ambitious organization with uh, big, big goals in terms of automation and digitalization. Hence, the, the, this is why I came to the Middle East from Singapore. Uh, some, of the, some of the most interesting aspects of what we're doing today uh, includes the creation of a performance room, which with all of our, as a matter of fact, uh, so that we can more efficiently and effectively understand what's happening in our ships real time and be able to have real time help to the crew on board. Also, it allows us to have better voyage. Uh, it increases safety. It improves on the area of decarbonization because we all know that better working equipment pollutes less and is safer for seafarers to use, for example. I could give you many examples, but that's one of the main initiatives we have. We're also working on this digital uh, uh, platform to connect all the many different data sources. Uh, we refer to it as a data orchestration platform. And this is not just a repository of data. This is a new technology that allows us to really connect 
all the different aspects of uh, data sources internally and externally, because to create a predictive environment, you need some external sources as well, so that uh, we are able to give the organization that predictive environment I talked about and what if scenarios, which means that we can play with potential decisions and what could be the potential impact of that decision for the business. Uh, <clears throat> now, one of the particular reasons I am very supportive of what's happening uh, with performance and uh, with this particular initiative that we have with Alpha Ori is that, you know, everybody's talking about decarbonization. There is a, there is a, a reality that will probably make me evil to mention here, but it's, it's a true, it's the truth that we all have to keep in mind. Decarbonization is extremely important because we have a world to take care of. We have children, we, we have new generations coming. We have to take care of the world. At the same time, we're executives in organizations. And as such, we need to ensure that decarbonization as any other initiatives are financially viable. Now, what we are doing right now in terms of performance improvement for our vessels is financially viable because it has a proper ROI attached to it. So I am very much in support of what Kenneth was mentioning, that any initiative we have in terms of technology need to come attached with that a new operational business model that allows it to be realistic. And I mentioned that because if we really want decarbonization to be successful, we need to ensure that it makes sense for businesses as well, that there is an ROI attached to it. Because at the end of the day, the responsibility of every executive for any public company or major organization is to increase shareholding value. And I think we should be realistic and not forget those aspects uh, so that we carefully manage from being realistic on the decarbonization arena and not getting to activism, because activism, in my view, will not get us anywhere. No, thanks, Chucky. Uh, just uh, being mindful of the time. I think we have 20 minutes before we can have another five minutes or 10 minutes of questions from the audience. So you said something that are very interesting and that stuck uh, with me. Uh, one is that, you know, obviously you could have gone out and built your own platform of Alpha Ori in that sense, or you chose to, you know, collaborate with somebody uh, of that was. And, and the second thing was, you know, why Singapore? You've been in Singapore for many years, and, and I'm glad that you still have the passion left in you, which is great. Um, so on that context, I, I know that we have 12, 10, 15 to 20 minutes. So what do you think reasons on why you decide to collaborate on some things? And what's your view on Singapore? And how are you going to f commit yourself into this ecosystem that will help a lot of us uh, uh, based out of Singapore? And I think that may help for okay. everybody to hear. Okay, very quickly. Collaboration, I think, is key. Uh, no organization today can do it all by themselves. Uh, while we need technology adoption, we are not an IT organization. And the truth is we can't have experts of every single technology that comes out there. So 100% collaboration is the key to successful technology adoption in the future, period. Why Singapore? Uh, I could mention many reasons that have been discussed already. One aspect that I'd like to mention is that Singapore has dramatically supported organizations and connected startup and young organizations and companies with major players in the industry. And this has enabled these young companies to focus on resolving real problems because they understand what is truly the pain points of these companies. This enables them to be more profitable because they actually resolve a real problem for the industry and attract more uh, new and young organizations to Singapore which hopefully will continue to increase the size of that ecosystem. Sure, thanks, Jakeep. And do you think that, um, like Bari as a large organization, you're going to invest into this, you know, uh, to help startups? Is that something that's on the radar? Well, uh, okay, uh, I know the, the, the chief investment officer and the chief strategy officer are listening, so probably they're breathing heavy with this question. 
uh, I believe so. Yes. Uh, I mean, we will we will invest in technology when it makes sense uh, as a business, and uh, when it makes sense for us to 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 gain a competitive advantage in one of our particular verticals in the organization. Uh, one of the tasks that I have taken very serious is to connect the the company Bahari and the, the government of Saudi Arabia whenever possible with Singapore, uh, because I believe there is a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from what I saw in Singapore. And in Saudi Arabia, there is a very, very aggressive agenda uh, for digitalization. And I think that there could be a lot of areas for synergy, because just like companies can't do it alone, countries can do it alone. So I think there is a lot that we can do if we work together. Thanks a lot, Shakib. Kenneth, I hope this is being recorded so that we can uh, uh, keep this in mind. But, but thanks a lot, Shakib, for your faith and, you know, really, really appreciate this. So on the same note, right, uh, before I give it to uh, Kenneth for home run on, on Vice Singapore, I'm sure uh, that will be hit out of the park. But, uh, Steen, um, from your perspective, I'm, I'm so grateful that, you know, Rightship has made this decision to anchor in, in Singapore and, and obviously, it gives us an opportunity to share our views on this whole thing. And I've, you've been a great listener, so thank you. Uh, on this uh, right ship again, you could compete, collaborate, uh, and, and where this is going. And, and why the decision to move into Singapore? Of course, you have explained on, on the key areas, but what's the future role if, uh, you know, if we can hear? That will be great for people who are listening from a tech perspective and also from a, a shipping perspective. Thank you, Steve. We are here um, chiefly because we are absolutely convinced that everybody else is either here or should be here and will be here. So we can find in the ecosystem in Singapore all the re relevant potential future partners to build the solutions that we know we in Rightship uh, have the competence to bring forward but that we also know we need to partner around. We, we saw earlier this week uh, the, the early announcement of the Singapore Decarbonization Center, and I think there's a session running in parallel in, in, in some other building right now that puts a little more meat on that, so I, I can't wait to get out of my chair to see what's, uh, what's in the media. But as, as you would have probably picked up, um, Singapore and its it's probably part of your closing, Kenneth, I hope, uh, is, is very alert to the fact that we need to build uh, on the ecosystem we have uh, available here already and have a very specific address around uh, what we can collaborate to do to solve uh, the many challenges that constitutes uh, the decarbonization uh, conundrum. We are going to be there as right ship. We will be at that Singapore decarbonization center uh, because we believe that's where we need to find our future friends. We are on the hunt to explore and ingest more good data and we are on the hunt to find partners who believe that some of the data we sit with uh, on our digital platform today can make sense in your businesses for you to make the decisions that, that you need to move towards. Uh, so that data orchestration uh, that, that you talked about, Shakib, very much goes beyond just orchestrating on a singular platform. I think it's a question of connecting platforms to platforms uh, and, and not insisting that we have to do everything ourselves, but to find the, the willing partners uh, that we can create these coalitions with. And being in Singapore is not just about decarbonization, but it's obviously uh, a challenge that preoccupies almost all of us in the industry and that will be with us for a long period of time. It's not just a question of this massive issue of finding the future fuels uh, that has been spoken a, a lot about this week and will continue to be with us, but it's also a question of finding nimble, quick technology-based solutions that will give us continuous improvements. And, and we see uh, a right ship very much uh, with a competence built on the current GHG rating that we would like to offer uh, to the industry. Uh, 
What we do within that space already today is really quite interesting because we, we started this GHG rating as a means to give transparency as to whether a singular vessel is sustainable compared to another vessel. So the A to G uh, rating based on, on EEDI. But it has grown since and it's, it's a great example of good use of data. So we are reverse engineering that and making it into a lot of different products that are being consumed by different users in the industry today. So this allows us, for instance, to hold a shipyard against another shipyard in terms of the likelihood to bring forward sustainable vessels. Right? We, can, we can basically see what are the last 10 vessels that have been given birth to in shipyard A versus shipyard B. What's the likelihood that you will see an A-rated vessel out of a shipyard that has never produced anything better than a D-rated vessel? You get data that will show you that. If you're a financial lender, uh, you start to, to get access to the same data that will give you uh, a good decision base to, 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 to make investment decisions and funding decisions based on sustainable finance principles. And again, it's, it's the same data sets that get re-engineered and, and made available. Singapore, however, is not for us just a question of uh, a decarbonization uh, journey. We've recently launched what, what I'm sure will be the, the gnarliest journey of all, but also one that really requires collaboration. Uh, and that's a journey towards using data to prove the correlation between the safety, the well-being, the health, the mental health, the care for the crew on board the vessel, and the incidents that the crew causes. We all know, data shows it very clearly, that far majority of incidents relate to the human element in application on board the vessel. We are world-class at scoring the safety of the vessel and the DOC. Our footprint in terms of scoring the crew is light. I think it's an enormous opportunity for all of us to come together around. And we have created a coalition of the willing with a starting point with uh, a small handful of very large ship management companies and a couple of ship owners, obviously speaking to charterers, so we get the chartering element in there as well. And we want to move towards harvesting all the right, right data points to prove what it takes to be a well-cared-for crew and how that crew will perform better in operation on the vessel. So you essentially will, will end up with a right ship safety score, a GHG rating, and a, a well-being rating of the crew. Uh, and again, we could not do, a, uh, an, we, we could make a, an effort like that on our own. We need to be in a place like Singapore where we have this uh, connected ecosystem. Thanks, Tim. Can I like you heard, um, Chucky, uh, whatever I have, uh, you know, known him for many years, he's quite a detailed person and he's a hard taskmaster and, and he's very passionate as well. So it, it, it's great. But like he answered that question, he said, as long as there is business sense, they, you know, people will put their money in. And, and coming from Chucky that way, and then Steve, you know, is also equally passionate and you saw how he's thinking about crew uh, in terms of scoring. Uh, so. And, and from my own sense, I can say as well, for if you are really passionate, we want to come into Singapore. But I think if I can speak for the three of us, one of the challenges, of course, will be talent on how do we address that? Because it's not end of the day, everything about technology. It's about technology, people and process. And, and human is at the center of everything, I think. And human machine interactions or whatever is happening. Uh, and the future workforce is going to be very different. So, so one last question and then. Uh, of course, you can tell us how Singapore is uniquely positioned. We, we, we have a good idea and, and perhaps lay out what's the roadmap. Uh, so uh, on behalf of three of us, maybe that one question, if you can help us on talent. And then obviously, uh, what Singapore is going to do forward and why Singapore is it's not a real question. But, you know, if you can throw some light on uh, and, and thanks uh, for that, Kenneth. Thank you. Uh... Captain Muni, and, and I think maybe I'll start off with the people. So I, I start to say that the first part is about finding the leaders uh, and also the innovators leaders. And it's all this innovation is also, I saw one question here, is about making the job of our maritime colleagues safer and more efficient. So 
this, if we start from this point of view that whatever innovation, business model innovation, technology innovation that we are doing is to help our maritime colleagues uh, to be safer and more efficient, I think that is the goal. Uh, you will hear many of the dialogue throughout this week, you know, uh, innovation, technology, but there's also another big theme is about can you get enough talent into marine time? And that has a lot of implication and consequence to us. So whatever we do today is actually laying down the foundation to attract the new talent into, uh, into marine time. So the classic example of the port using uh, automation of the crane so that you have a control room and you can, one person can control six cranes or three cranes allow diversity of workforce to come in into the, into the port so that you could have uh, diversity of gender, you know, colleagues coming in, uh, as what Klaus mentioned in his uh, opening uh, chair remarks. Uh, likewise, for ship management, I think one day it will be a lot more like a control room where you could have uh, colleagues gender indifference, uh, neutral, you can come in and work on it on, the sh on a periodic manner and go home at a fixed time as well to take care of your families and or to attend to your personal matters. I think that will be the time in which then you can start to see more talent attracted to marine time. And this talent can be in all sorts of skills. It could be communication to the ship, it could be analysis, it can be data analytics, it could be procurement, it could be many aspects, compliance, standards. All this will then open up if we have the right innovation and technology. Uh, and Singapore, I think we don't take for granted our hub status, but we built over the years from a port, entry port, to become a transshipment hub. Uh, and then we build up the International Marine Time Center, attracting and uh, you know, uh, supporting many of the companies to set up here so that you build up the ecosystem of business and commercial and operation. This new phase is to bring the innovation companies into Singapore. So that uh, you know, in yesterday's um, panel discussion, marine tech become the next keyword now that we are now pursuing. Can Singapore be the marine tech such that you can augment the port, the IMC, and many of the sub-ecosystem players that are here? I think that will be our aim. And underneath that is really the whole talent development. So we're going to launch uh, you know, marine time leadership program. We have internships. We have uh, many programs that actually supports our industry to to be more uh, competitive, because to be frank, the one of the drawback for Singapore is talent, and we are not, we are also competing, uh, you know, across many sectors. You have the financial sector, legal, insurance, right? You have medi medicine, so many sectors here, and we need to get our own fair share. And only through collaboration can we put forth to the, the newer generation that this is an industry to work on, right? So I, I will leave you with that. And uh, just, just to touch on one question, which is on collaboration, the obstacle for collaboration, in my view, really is about whether can we grow the pie, the decarbonization is a classic example of nobody has a concrete answer, right? So when nobody has a concrete answer, either you duplicate effort by everyone trying your own solution pathways, or could we come together to collaborate and find the pathway? That is the whole premise of the whole Decarb Center, is to come together in a neutral platform to chart out the journey in which every company then can decide how you can take on uh, the DCAP agenda. And Singapore will provide the regulatory, because we are the bunkering hub, we can provide the standards, operating uh, protocol, and so, so on and so forth to support the industry pursuing this area. So this is why we kind of set up the center here in Singapore. Captain Nuni, back to you, thanks. 
Thanks, Kenneth. Thanks. Makes a lot of sense. And, you know, uh, given the fact that when we started 15 years ago, uh, uh, we only had resistance, whether it was my wife or family, uh, I, or even from the bank. Singapore definitely has helped us, you know, get wherever we are, whatever little we could do. So I'm 100% convinced. And I also know that uh, you generally monitor the progress quite uh, keenly, which also means that we are held accountable for whatever we do. So that I think is also, uh, you know, gets us to do better every time. So thank you for that. Uh, only thing, Kenneth, I'm not able to see the questions, and I know we have a few minutes left for questions that we can take from the audience. Since I don't see that on my panel, do you want to pick up one or two relevant questions because we have about eight to nine minutes, I see, um, and then you know put it up to any one of us who you think is relevant. Does it make sense? Am I audible? Can I? One, one interesting question that came up on Slido. Let's get rid of this. Uh, can technology be used to improve human reliability? And that's a really interesting question because it sort of ties those two topics together. I mean, my view on that would be if we are, once we're starting to automate, uh, workflows uh, through, for example, augmented reality. If you're on a ship and you're performing a particular task and the AI, uh, AR goggles help you to overlay information and give you guidance how to perform the task, at the same time you're probably recording that and we have an audit trail, that kind of technology would help to identify additional training needs. And then if you bring people into, say, the virtual reality training for providing very focused refresher training, Again, at the same time, because it's just a software environment, you know exactly in, on an individual level how people are doing and how they're improving over time. And that you could potentially translate into you know, the rating of personnel that you mentioned earlier. But I'll be curious how, what the panel thinks about that. Maybe I'll just start first. And uh, I think, indeed, technology uh, could actually assist. It must, it must be an assistive technology approach to the workforce. Here we are trying to uh, encourage the workforce to reskill, right, and relearn. And this is where the technology will help in assisting the company to do that. So identifying the areas, first is which area do you improve the reliability? It must be the highest risk area in which a company view the operation, and from that, Risk, as the earlier panel mentioned, is a very uh, is a common word that the enterprise knows very well. If you have a risk, you become you go into a risk registry, and then you have a mitigation on what do you do to mitigate this risk. And then the technology, uh, virtual learning, it could be simulation engine, it could be uh, AI assist assistance to kind of point out some of these areas and that will actually help uh, the workforce yeah i think we have uh, we have years and years and years of proof um, we don't necessarily have to think of technology as uh, what can we create in future but we should also look at what what do we have in front of us that um, where where technology has come into play and again, a lot of that has been discussed here in, 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 during Singapore Maritime Week. If we just go a few uh, years back, uh, it, it was new that class societies introduced drones uh, as part of, of their uh, inspection regime. Um, and that was a question of risk and a question of cost. And I think both of them are, are in play. And if you look at your, your enterprise risk and your enterprise cost, across all the activity levels, uh, you will find an, an endless number of opportunities where you can intersect technology solutions uh, to, to augment your current analog operation um, and, and essentially improve. And then it's a question of making that risk or cost hierarchy and working through uh, whether one can produce oneself or one need the partnerships that we have talked about here. Shakib, do you want to go first before I take that? Reading the accident report I think, I think in 2017 they, where a U.S. Navy destroyer collided with a tanker here uh, in Singapore. I'm hearing, um, I think. sorry, I have Main something in my... Um, 
with you know people being too tired, mm -hmm. but also which I find personally very interesting is bad user experience design. And it was a, a situation where the U.S. Uh, had so much advanced technology on board that people got totally confused, you know, because you could use functionality in different workstations. And there was a great example of, you know, too much technology and badly designed user experience and the human factor, you know, resulting in really bad outcomes. And, and maybe that's, that tees us up to a whole different discussion I'm, I'm sure we'll have many of, uh, and, and that's essentially how do we address the issue of uh, an increasing... Uh, automation of uh, the vessel itself, uh, not just in terms of competence right here, right now in, in the navigation and, and in handling uh, the different uh, machineries that, that we are seeing come on, on stream, but also as we see the vessels become uh, stepwise more and more autonomous, uh, we need to, to reframe our way of thinking how we support those decision-making processes. And again, uh, it, it's part technology and it's part back to what you talk about, Kenneth, developing the competence to, to support that kind of infrastructure. I think we're just about on time. Any last remarks from, from anybody here? Otherwise, I think this would be the perfect transition scheme what you just mentioned is because this afternoon will be about human factor uh, speakers and about autonomous shipping. So we have exactly those two topics in the afternoon. So I think I would encourage everybody to come back uh, breaking for lunch now and we will should be back by 1.30. So we have 90 minutes. And thank you very much uh, for the panel, both here and uh, virtually. Uh, thank you. Thanks.